Ram, is it time to start? Okay, great. Uh, welcome everybody. Today I have the great, great pleasure to introduce my, uh, my great friend, uh, Dr. Ivana Pandrea, uh, who has contributed over the years tremendously to the HIV research. Uh, Dr. Pandrea got her medical degree at the uh, Grigore Popa University of uh, Romania. And uh, after that, she moved to a residency program in pathology, a joint program between the University of Lassi Romania and, uh, and um, uh, uh, Paul Brusso's Hospital in France. She worked for one year in an international medical research center in Gabon. And after that, uh, Ivona moved to uh, complete her postdoctoral fellowship at the Tulane National Primate Research Center. And she worked with some of the leaders in the field of uh, HIV mucosal biology, including Ron, uh, Ron Wiese, Preston Marx, Andrew Lackner, and others. Ivona rose to the uh, rank of associate professor, and in 2009, she moved to the Department of Pathology at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, in 2013, she became a full professor at the Department of Pathology and uh, Department of Infectious Diseases and Microbiology at the University of Pittsburgh. Ivana has published more than 90 publications, some of which are seminal works in the field of uh, HIV and SIV uh, pathogenesis. Uh, her work is extremely inspiring and has been continued in the work of, any other, of many other investigators. Uh, she was uh, among the researchers who explained the importance of uh, the disruption of uh, the uh, uh, gut homeostasis in HIV, uh, uh, HIV infection, the importance of translocation of uh, microbial products and following uh, inflammation. Currently, she is uh, she's researching uh, HIV and SIV related comorbidities, including heart and liver disease immunotherapies, which are aiming to uh, reduce the uh, uh, HIV and SIV related inflammation, changes in gut uh, microbiome in both HIV and SIV infections, depletion of uh, regulatory T cells, uh, the effect of uh, neutrophil extracellular traps on the inflammation and pathogenesis in uh, SIV infected macaques, and most recently in the co-infection uh, COVID and HIV models in, in, uh, in uh, rhesus macaques. With that, I will let Ivana speak. I'm sure we will greatly enjoy her seminar. Thank you very much, Zenek, for such a nice introduction and uh, for inviting me to open uh, the, the seminar series in your department. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I would have loved to meet you in person, but the situation is such. so. Maybe this will happen in the future. Um, I would like to uh, start by uh, um, saying that I don't have any conflicts of interest. And with that, I would like to um, start uh, discussing some of our results obtained during the last years um, regarding the SIV and HIV related immune activation and inflammation. This subject is timely because uh, we now have a very good um, um, antiretroviral therapies, which um, are able to completely control virus replication. Uh, still, the, the patients uh, infected with HIV um, present with a residual immune activation and inflammation, which is responsible for an incomplete immune restoration and for the development of numerous comorbidities, which reduce the quality of life of the persons living with HIV. Um, very strong support for the paradigm in which immune activation and inflammation are major predictors of HIV disease progression comes from comparative studies between a progressive and non-progressive non-human primate model of um, AIDS. Our uh, laboratory work with almost all the non-human primate models um, existent in the field, and we developed several of these. Uh, for the progressive models, we are mainly using rhesus macaques and pigtail macaques, while for the non-progressive models, we are using African non-human primate species, African green monkeys, mandrels, and sooty mangabees. Um, 
it is well known that this species, although uh, infected at high levels of prevalence in the wild, they do not develop AIDS. So during the years, we were um, interested to understand what are the causes of the non-pathogenicity in these models. Uh, and we performed comparative studies between progressive and non-progressive models. We show that the lack of pathogenicity in the natural host is not due to a lack of virus replication because both non-progressive and progressive models replicate the virus at very high levels, um, at least higher than uh, in the HIV patients, uh, which are untreated with antiretroviral drugs. Uh, the target cells seem to be uh, similar between um, uh, non-progressive and progressive hosts. They are mainly CD4 cells and macrophages. The only thing that we found different between these species are the levels of immune activation, here shown by uh, the levels of uh, HLA-DR and K67, and also the dynamics of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So uh, our laboratory and other labs uh, involved with, um, with experiments in natural host um, published um, a large number of, uh, of papers showing that the main difference between the non-progressive and the progressive host are the levels of immune activation and inflammation. Somehow the, the, the natural host succeeded to dissociate the high virus replication from uh, the associated uh, immune activation and inflammation. And uh, this is a key factor involved in the non-pathogenicity uh, of SIV in this species. As shown in uh, multiple very elegant reviews, um, the nature of HIV-associated immune activation is inflammation is multifactorial. Um, the virus itself induces inflammation. The antiretroviral drugs have toxicity, co-infection with other um, uh, opportunistic pathogens um, are also a part of, um, of this residual inflammation, loss of different uh, T cell subsets like T regulatory cells and TH17. And of course, the intestinal dysfunction was proposed as a major cause of, of uh, immune activation and inflammation via the microbes which are translocated from the gut lumen into the general circulation. And because this microbial translocation uh, theory was uh, initially controversial, um, our lab uh, tried to directly demonstrate it through several um, uh, experiments. Um, I'm uh, just showing here an image uh, published by uh, Dueck and uh, Branchley, uh, which um, um, advanced the microbial translocation hypothesis. They show that in HIV-infected patients and also in the SIV-infected uh, rhesus macaques, there is a large number of um, microbial products in the circulation. And almost in the same time and in collaboration with them, we show that the natural host lack microbial translocation. So this offered us an, uh, an ideal system in which we could uh, model microbial translocation and determine if this will induce uh, inflammation and immune activation. We did this by several um, experiments. First of all, we administered LPS um, uh, by bypassing uh, the effective mucosal uh, barrier which is characteristic to, to the AGMs infected with SIV. And we did this in uh, two different experiments, either as a single dose administration or a prolonged uh, LPS administration. And as you can see from this slide, um, the LPS administration resulted in increases in the immune activation markers, both T cells and macrophages, and also in increases in the viral load. We then tried to uh, more um, better model uh, microbial translocation uh, by damaging the gut epithelium. And for this, we used um, dextran sulfate, a detergent which is used to induce colitis in urine models. Uh, this was a collaboration with Jake Estes, uh, which was then at NIH. Uh, we administered DSS to both non-infected rhesus macaques and to chronically infected African green monkeys. Uh, and as you can see from this slide, in the non-infected rhesus macaque, we induced epithelial lesions and microbial translocation, which was in the same range with the one reported for chronically infected um, rhesus macaques. And as a result, we saw an increase in the immune activation markers on the T cells. Um, 
And uh, the African green monkey is chronically infected with, uh, with SIV. When treated with DSS, um, developed colitis, um, as proved here by this photo taken during the colonoscopy. You can see the red patches, which demonstrate the development of colitis. It was not a very severe colitis. It was not a bloody, uh, the animals did not have a bloody diarrhea, but, uh, but uh, these images uh, clearly demonstrate that we induce colitis using DSS. As a result, we saw microbial translocation. We saw increases in the immune activation markers. Uh, inflammatory markers and uh, a, a small but consistent increase in the in the viral loads. Um, so, related to these um, studies, which um, which directly tested the the hyper, the theory of microbial translocation, we have some current studies in progress. Uh, we are performing now uh, comparative or uh, parallel experiments in which we deplete CD4 cells in uh, African green monkeys, um, either deplete CD4 cells in these animals or um, administer DSS for a longer period of time. These experiments are very long-term experiments. Um, they, the animals are treated for uh, one year, one year and a half with these agents with the aim to determine the mechanism of the gut dysfunction and also the consequences of this gut dysfunction. We finalized the CD4 depletion experiment and I can tell you that nothing happened. So the animals, the African green monkeys did not develop gut dysfunction. They did not get immune activation and inflammation and they did not progress to AIDS. So it looks like the virus replication alone or CD4 T cell depletion alone is not sufficient to induce AIDS. Uh, in the absence of the immune activation and inflammation. We are still analyzing the DSS data. Um, during the rest of my presentation, I would like to introduce uh, new um, key parameters that may be responsible uh, for residual immune activation and inflammation in, in the patients infected with HIV. Uh, I call them the new kids on the block uh, because um, there are not so many studies um, uh, investigating them. So the first of all, um, it's um, the, um, a hypercoagulous state may be a source of immune activation and inflammation. This was reported in the HIV patients a while ago. And um, the uh, clinical trials which reported this also found a, a, a strong correlation between hypercoagulation and the inflammation in the HIV infected patients. Uh, in the same time, and in collaboration with uh, Russell Tracy, which was part of all these clinical trials, we also showed that the progressive SIV infection in uh, rhesus macaques and pigtail macaques are also characterized by significant increases in the coagulation markers, D-dimer and thrombin, antithrombin, the same markers that were used in the, in the human uh, clinical trials. Um, but these markers remain unchanged in the non-progressive models. We found a strong correlation between hypercoagulation and inflammatory markers or immune activation markers, so, such as interleukin-6, uh, soluble CD14, and KS67. And the same correlation, strong correlation between um, hypercoagulation and uh, inflammation um, was present also during the natural aging process. This is a large cohort of, African, of wild African green monkeys from, from Gambia. Uh, so animals in their natural habitat, which clearly show an increase in the D-dimers levels uh, while uh, the animals are aging. The same thing is it's true for the, for the pro-inflammatory markers. So hypercoagulation seems to be uh, to go hand in hand with uh, immune activation and inflammation. So we, we try to understand what can be the link between coagulation and inflammation. And our collaborator from uh, Case Western University, uh, now at uh, Columbus University, uh, Nicolas van der Berg, reported a while ago that uh, monocytes isolated from um, people living with age uh, overexpress tissue factor. 
during a collaboration with Irini Serretti and Ivo Franceschetti uh, and Bruno Andrade from NIH, we also showed the same thing. The HIV patients um, had an increased uh, level of, of tissue factor on their monocyte. And this remained high even in the patients um, uh, after treatment with uh, antiretroviral drugs. So I sent samples from my animals, both African green monkeys and pigtail macaques, so progressive, non-progressive to urini. And um, the guys show uh, the same thing. The progressive models, um, the monocyte uh, isolated from the pigtail macaques expressed high levels of tissue factor while the African green monkeys uh, had uh, none. Um, we showed the same thing uh, in tissues isolated from my animals. The tissue factor expression increases in the gut uh, in the SIV uh, infected uh, pigtail macaque, so the progressive model. As you can see, prior to infection, there are just uh, a couple of positive cells, but during acute infection, uh, the number of positive cells increase here at the tip of the villi. Then uh, with the progression uh, in the infection, these cells become more preeminent in the entire thickness of, of mucosa, and they are more and more present in the lymphoid tissue associated with the gut. Um, Irini and, and Bruno then uh, tried to determine how uh, expression of tissue factor and how uh, the coagulation uh, factors can increase inflammation. And in some very elegant in vitro experiments, they uh, stimulated the cells from the HIV uh, infected patients with, um, uh, with thrombin. Uh, and show that the tissue factor expression is increasing uh, together with, uh, with the um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And when they apply an inhibitor for PAR1, uh, both expression of tissue factor and expression uh, and production of pro-inflammatory cytokines decreased. So uh, they clearly show that um, the PAR1 is involved in this um, vicious circle. They also show that the, the cells which express tissue factor are more prone to produce more pro-inflammatory cytokines compared with the cells which do not express tissue factor. And not only they produce more cytokines, but they produce multiple cytokines. So they were polyfunctional. They show that for uh, monocytes isolated from uh, HIV infected, uh, from healthy donors, but also from HIV infected patients, and also from, from uh, our uh, non-human primates. So um, this study established a paradigm in which uh, induction of tissue factor expression and activation of thrombin uh, generates um, uh, a production of pro-inflammatory cytokines via PAR1, which in turn will produce, will, will induce more tissue factor expression. And um, this will result uh, in a vicious circle. So our result placed the tissue factor at the crossroad of the coagulation and inflammation vicious circle and showed that tissue factor may be an attractive therapeutic target to prevent chronic inflammation and disease progression. And in fact, we performed such a, a pilot experiment. We, in collaboration with, um, Dr. Franceschetti uh, from NIH, uh, he isolated uh, Ixolaris, a tissue factor inhibitor from thick saliva, and he used this uh, drug in several biological systems, showing that, for example, um, it, it, it has the capacity to inhibit metastasis in, in cancer-infected uh, mice. Um, the first step was to, um, to um, confirm that the drug is efficient in humans and in, in chronically infected pigtail macaques. And this was the case. The Ixolaris completely inhibit the factor uh, 10A formation. And we then administer this uh, drug uh, to a small number of animals. Pigtail macaques infected with SIV, uh, the animals were not treated with antiretroviral drugs. So the results are not spectacular, but uh, we have to keep in mind that the animals were not treated with antiretroviral drugs. We were not able to uh, see differences in the uh, levels of virus replication between the treated and untreated animals. Uh, but the good news were that um, uh, we, uh, we uh, improved survival. Uh, in the treated group, we did not have any rapid progressor. Uh, 
um, uh, I would like to repeat that this is a very pathogenic infection. Usually two out of five animals progress to AIDS before 100 days post-infection, but in the treated group, we, we did not have such a, a case. Uh, we ameliorate the, the coagulation status. Uh, the treatment succeeded to decrease, but not normalize um, the D-dimer levels in, in the animals. And we had some uh, modest but present um, differences uh, in the levels, in some of the levels of the uh, immune activation markers, especially on the macrophages. The only cytokine which was impacted was interleukin 17. We didn't see differences for the other uh, cytokines. So um, with this experiment, I think our data support a, a bidirectional relationship between coagulation and inflammation. Uh, we show that inflammation induces coagulation through overexpression of tissue factor and inflammatory cytokines, while coagulation markers, uh, tissue factor and thrombin, activate mononuclear endothelial cells and platelet via PAR1, uh, thus further uh, fueling inflammatory cytokines production. And this creates a coagulation inflammation uh, vicious circle. Um, that, um, that is uh, very important. We thus present a new paradigm in which hypercoagulation is very important, not only for maintaining immune activation and inflammation, but also for promoting cardiovascular comorbidities. We were able to show in the animals which had hypercoagulability um, that uh, in the tissues, uh, there are also um, very frequent uh, microthrombi um, and this microthrombi, I think, may constitute um, a, a common mechanism for the development of uh, multiple comorbidities. The microthrombosis may uh, promote fibrosis and end stage organ. And in fact, um, it was uh, interesting that in, uh, in uh, the more recent SARS um, outbreak, um, um, it, um, uh, in COVID patients, uh, also a hypercoagulable state uh, was, uh, was reported, uh, especially in the severe cases, and uh, anticoagulant treatment seems to have a, a, a positive impact on the survival. Um, I would also like to stress that this may be important, um, even more important for uh, elderly patients, which are disproportionately affected by a prothrombotic status. So they may be at a higher risk to develop cardiovascular comorbidities and other comorbidities due to their uh, hypercoagulable status, which is related with aging. And this was also um, uh, seen recently uh, for COVID patients uh, in which elderly are more uh, prone to severe disease than, uh, than younger. And I think hypercoagulability may play an important role. It is the same for our um, HIV infected patients. Uh, it, it is very important because in the United States, um, more than 50% of these patients uh, are uh, older than 50 years old. So uh, they may be at higher risk for development, um, for, for maintaining residual um, inflammation and immune activation in developing uh, multiple comorbidities. Um, the next steps related to this, um, this uh, project is to test new anticoagulants. We already tested the thrombin inhibitor and the PAR1 inhibitor. Um, but I can tell you right now that they were not as efficient uh, as the tissue factor inhibitor. They did not reduce the level of D-dimer. And although we saw some impact on the immune activation uh, markers um, at uh, selected time points during uh, infection, um, they were not very strong. So uh, I think overall uh, their impact was, uh, was weaker than the tissue factor. And this shows us that it is maybe important to intervene uh, with an anticoagulant treatment, which is uh, as high as possible in the, in the coagulation uh, cascade. We will continue with the factor 10A inhibitor uh, for the same reason. Well, so now following in, uh, in the path of Zdenek and his very elegant studies of uh, netosis in, uh, in cancer, uh, we investigated the possible role of, of excessive netosis uh, in uh, residual immune activation, inflammation, and hypercoagulation in, um, in HIV and SIV uh, infected individuals. Um, just briefly, um, netosis is, is the process through which the neutrophils are releasing uh, their extracellular trap. 
uh, it's a different type of neutrophil response and death. Uh, and the, these nets are formed uh, by uh, DNA and uh, associated uh, proteases. So we were the first to show that um, excessive netosis occur in SIV infection. Um, it starts very early after infection, uh, which uh, suggests that it's a response to the virus itself, but it becomes more severe during chronic infection. And um, it, it, in a way it's logical because during chronic infection, we have uh, very high levels of virus replication, but also uh, high levels of microbial translocation. So we have more triggers uh, for these nets. Netosis is not uh, normalized with antiretroviral drugs uh, and it, they remain significantly higher. So netosis, it's a, it's a normal process. It's a way of neutrophils to fight. It's another way of neutrophils to fight uh, microorganisms, um, bacteria, gram positive, negative, and viruses. As shown here in, in, in our figure, they are able to, to capture uh, variants. Uh, but when it is excessive, um, we think that it may induce some collateral damages. Um, so when we, um, when we um, co-cultured uh, stimulated neutrophils with other cell subtypes, we observe that the neutrophil, the, the nets released by the neutrophils are able to capture these cells, either T cells, CD4 or CD8 or B cells or, or monocytes. The capturing was um, did not discriminate between infected and non-infected animals. I think it was just a, a pure mechanical uh, process. It was a, a collateral damage, but but these images may explain the excessive immune cell loss during uh, HIV and SIV infection and maybe the lack of recovery. It can also explain why cells which are not infected with the virus are uh, are um, um, excessively dying. Um, here we just show the modifications of the cells which are trapped in the nets. You can see that they are disintegrating. The, the nuclear, the membrane is uh, forming blebs. Uh, nuclei are fragmented. Um, we observed high levels of apoptosis, but probably there is also direct uh, cell lysis uh, as well. So um, ne excessive netosis will induce um, uh, immune cell loss. We also showed that um, this is not a, a, an in vitro artifact because when we analyze the tissues isolated from our progressive uh, host, the pigtail macaques infected with SIV, we can observe um, um, uh, nets in the tissues, um, in several tissues, in fact. This is the gut uh, where you can see uh, numerous nets associated with um, uh, crypt abscesses, uh, but also they are. Um, nets at distance from the crypt abscesses. So it's, they are not only the abscesses which are um, associated with the nets. We also observed um, nets in the, in the liver, in the lung, in the, in, in the blood vessel from kidney and heart. Um, as in uh, for, for the in vitro experiments, these nets were able to capture T cells or macrophages. And very interestingly here in the lower images, um, you can see uh, in the eye uh, panel, uh, there is a very small uh, capillary uh, in the heart, which show an obstruct, a, 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 a small barrier formed by the neutrophils in their nets. So this is highly suggestive that nets can contribute also to the microthrombosis, which is um, um, present in the tissues in the SIV infected animals, and it can stimulate uh, and enhance hypercoagulation uh, in these systems. In fact, uh, we also showed that the nets were able to capture platelets, uh, here shown in red. Uh, these platelets uh, aggregated. You see here huge nets which are capturing a, a lot of platelets. Um, and uh, very interestingly, the neutrophils that generated the nets and the nets themselves also express tissue factor. So um, our experiments um, support two uh, major conclusion. We think that netosis may induce inflammation by releasing proteases in pro-inflammatory cytokines or by inducing cell death, which is pro-inflammatory per se. 
Um, and the cell immune um, trapped in the net uh, are probably activated. So uh, they are also more prone to produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we are proposing uh, uh, the nets being um, a, a significant uh, cause for residual immune activation and inflammation. And also I think netosis may explain, uh, because they capture so many, they, they are able to capture platelets, may explain at least in part um, uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, which is associated with SIV and HIV infection, but also hypercoagulability uh, in, in, the, in, in the presence of low platelet numbers, because the platelets um, captured in the net aggregate, um, they are activated probably, and furthermore, the, the neutrophils and the nets themselves um, uh, overexpress tissue factor. Um, Netosis was also more recently uh, being reported as being detrimental in SARS-infected um, patients. Um, and uh, there are several studies uh, which are investigating the role of netosis uh, in, this, uh, in this new infection. Um, so I think this opens um, some uh, therapeutic strategies for uh, both uh, COVID, but also for HIV-infected patients. The last subject that I would like to touch with my presentation um, is about uh, a detrimental impact of a high fat diet uh, in the natural history of SIV infection in non-human primates, especially for uh, the residual, also in relation to residual immune activation and inflammation and the development of uh, numerous comorbidities. Um, I am uh, passionate about this subject because I think it's uh, understudied, it's a neglected aspect. Uh, it is not unexpected because diet studies are very difficult in, in humans. Um, it is very difficult to, to perform very controlled diet in, in human patients. But theoretically, diet has a, has a big potential to impact the SIV and HIV pathogenesis because it is well known, it's associated with um, impairments of the gut barrier, uh, microbial translocation, um, alteration of the coagulation profiles, inducing of low-grade systemic inflammation as shown in, in diabetic patients. So again, we used both our models, the progressive ones and the non-progressive ones, uh, and we uh, treated them with a, a diet which were, was very high in cholesterol and, um, and saturated fatty acids. We treated these animals prior to SIV infection to, to better um, model the, the real life situation in which persons with unhealthy diet will become HIV infected. And um, these are our results. Um, we first observed um, modifications in the gut uh, in our animals. Um, the first observation was that there are more neutrophils accumulating in, in, the, um, in the animals which were treated with the Western diet. And we know that accumulation of neutrophils is detrimental. It is associated with more uh, crypt abscesses and also uh, with a rapid disease progression in our animals. In terms of immune populations um, changes, it was interesting. We saw a decrease in the CD40 cells even prior to the SIV infection um, in the gut. Um, and this uh, was true for um, naive uh, central memory and effector memory cells. Uh, interestingly, we observed a decrease in the, in the number of T regulatory cells in the gut. And um, such a decrease may not be beneficial because these cells are usually uh, responsible for um, keeping inflammation at bay. Uh, as a result, we saw some uh, modifications in the, uh, in the markers associated with alteration in mucosal barrier, such as LPS and IFVP. Um, I would like to point that uh, for the entire study, uh, more effects of the fat diet was seen in, in the non-progressive model, which makes sense because this is a, a cleaner model. They do not have intestinal dysfunction. Um, so it, it was probably easier to, to see an impact of the Western diet. In the, in the very pathogenic model of pigtail macaque, the, the gut damage is so severe that it was probably difficult to 
see uh, an, uh, an extra effect of the fat diet. But in pigtail macaques, we were still able to see um, an increase of pro-inflammatory uh, cells in the adipose tissue. Uh, you can see in the, here in the slide the peritoneal fat and also the epicardial fat. Uh, in the right panel, you can see that the inflammation is, is sometimes such so severe that it penetrates um, the, the blood vessels, the, the coronaries, uh, and it can surely induce lesions uh, in the lumen. Uh, some of the activation, immune activation markers uh, and inflammation markers were increased um, in the uh, fat-treated animals compared with uh, no fat-treated animals. Uh, we saw um, liver steatosis in all our animals, um, no matter what species. Um, and um, we also uh, observed a small degree of fibrosis, uh, not very, very important. Uh, probably it was not enough time for the animals to develop um, very severe um, liver lesions. Um, some of the uh, cardiovascular risk factors were also modified, uh, especially in African green monkeys. Again, um, the cholesterol was increased, oxidized HDL, uh, soluble tissue factor, P-selectin, uh, soluble ICAM. In the pigtail macaques, we, we could not detect differences in these markers because, as I said, the infection is very pathogenic, so it is difficult to, to see um, these effects, but we were able to see uh, increases in the factor, uh, coagulation factor eight. And uh, interestingly, I mean, it's very clear that we induced uh, myocardial damage in some of these animals as shown here by the levels of troponin uh, one. Um, importantly, the survival in PTMs uh, was, uh, was lower. And this was also reported by another um, Western diet study in SIV infected rhesus macaques, uh, previously done by another team. We also lost one of the, the African green monkeys, which it was surprising. And I can tell you in 20 years of working with this model, this is the first animal we, we lost. Uh, so it was um, puzzling. Um, we analyzed the tissues um, and for the pigtail macaques, we cannot report um, lesions which were different from uh, the other SIV infected macaques. However, uh, these lesions were more severe and they occurred earlier. Uh, and as a result, uh, the animals died earlier. Uh, we just show here some example, for example, the, in, uh, the infiltration with um, inflammatory cells in the myocardium, in the pericardium, epicardium was higher, very high in this group, uh, cytolysis of the myocardium, fatty infiltration, microthrombi, um, fibrosis, um, uh, which is shown here also by a trichrome staining. Um, fibrosis was more severe in the high fat diet um, treated animals. We saw uh, more um, lesions of incipient atherosclerosis, sometimes complicated with microthrombi. Um, so all these animals developed more severe cardiovascular lesions and earlier. Uh, very interesting, it was the case of the African green monkey, uh, which died during the follow-up. Uh, it is here represented in red. You can see that these animals had um, higher levels of immune activation. Uh, all the other markers were um, um, increased compared with the rest of the group, but the most different was the level of D-dimer, which, um, which is a marker highly predictive for death, disease progression in death in HIV infected patients and SIV infected macaques. It, was, it is probably one of the best predictor, predictive markers. Uh, used nowadays in clinical trials and in uh, non-human primate studies. Uh, also, the, the tissues from these animals showed very interesting lesions. The gut uh, was affected. Um, you can see here the villi are dilated and infiltrated with foamy macrophages, uh, which in association with uh, a hepatic granuloma can suggest an atypical mycobacteria infection. 
we were not able to identify uh, the bacilli uh, uh, by special staining. Uh, we performed at Seal Nielsen, what we, we were not able to, to identify them. But this animal had other, um, other opportunistic infections like isospora and also cytomegalovirus, cytomegalovirus um, in the gut, uh, which was highly predictive for a progressive infection. Uh, the animal had thrombotic microangiopathy and stasis in the, in the kidney and also in the lung associated with hemosiderin laden macrophages, which are also suggestive for heart insufficiency. Um, so in conclusion, our studies um, show that diet should be taken into consideration as a, a factor that may uh, uh, may uh, impact the, the level of immune activation and inflammation in HIV-infected patients and um, SIV-infected uh, macaques. Um, the, the, the impact of the administration of the fed diet is not so spectacular. It's, it's not comparable with the drug administration. But I think the power of, uh, of the diet is um, uh, is due to the fact that the diet can impact several organs, multiple organs, and, uh, and uh, in establish um, system axes that promote comorbidities in all these, uh, these organs and can be a, a big contributor to the development of, of, of comorbidities, not only cardiovascular, but also liver, kidney, um, and other comorbidities. Um, our current activity is to test Western diets in, in, in normal and antiretroviral treated non-human primates because uh, we, uh, we think that the association with antiretroviral therapy will be even more detrimental um, um, for, for, the, for the HIV patients. We really think that the diet should be taken into consideration when, de in, when designing clinical trials, analyzing the data, because it can probably impact several, um, several uh, uh, parameters measured in these uh, clinical trials. And um, I think the role of the diet and adiposity was uh, also uh, uh, very well demonstrated in, in COVID patients in which it was shown that uh, uh, um, a high body index is associated with um, um, more severe course of disease. Um, so I, I had a, a great uh, lab team who performed all these studies. Uh, they are um, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, young investigators. Um, they, are, they are a very nice group of young people, very dedicated. Um, and uh, of course, our success is also due to um, our collaborators at the University of Pittsburgh, but also University of Colorado. Rush University, Northwestern University of Vermont, Los Alamos, Pasteur Institute, Yerkes at NIH, um, Ohio State University, Case Western. Uh, and um, I hope that uh, in the near future, we'll be able maybe to establish some, some collaboration with University of Alabama, um, uh, strong uh, HIV and SIV researchers. Thank you very much. That was outstanding. Thank you. So we don't have any questions in the chat. Um, I definitely have one for you. Um, related to those future directions with the uh, um, art therapy, um, have you noticed in the patient population, are there certain organs that have a residual viral load that are more susceptible to some of this inflammation than others? Yes, I think um, residual virus replication was reported in the gut, um, but um, yes, probably we should look more into this. Um, in our animals, um, we, we did not complete yet um, this viral load study, so I cannot tell you exactly. Uh, the gut seems to be, gut and lymph nodes seem to be you know, the sites which, um, 
which should be targeted. Also, adipose tissue. Um, this is what we uh, observed more recently. Adipose tissue is a big, um, um, a big site of, I think it's a big reservoir, in fact. If I may, I have uh, two questions, uh, Ivana. One is uh, the Ixolaris uh, uh, TF inhibitor. Is it potentially safe or is it thought as potentially being safe for use in humans? And if not, uh, uh, are there any alternative uh, TF uh, tissue factor inhibitors? Yeah, um, the drug is not yet developed. Uh, we did not have any uh, adverse effect in our animals. But I cannot um, tell you for humans, uh, really. Uh, I don't think it was tested. Um, they, are, um, they are not other tissue factor inhibitors, unfortunately, uh, developed. Uh, I, I saw that there is one in development right now, but I don't, uh, I don't know exactly in what stage uh, there is. Um, if not, the closest to a tissue factor inhibitor will be a factor XA inhibitor. It's um, uh, it's also a factor ten. A. It's it's very high uh, in the coagulation cascade, but it's not a tissue factor inhibitor. Thank you. And uh, in your wonderful presentations, you you showed a lot of uh, uh, relevance of uh, co coagulation uh, to the disease pathogenesis HIV infection. It is also a major. Uh, mechanisms of pathogenesis in SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. Can you elaborate on potential impact of HIV SARS-CoV-2 infection? Yeah, this is what we are planning to do. Uh, we have, a, we have, a, we were, uh, we received a recently a small grant to to look in into the co-infection SIV and uh, SARS. Um, so I, I think the, the patient will be at a higher risk because of the cumulative effect of, of hypercoagulation um, induced by both um, infectious um, disease agents. Yes, this is, uh, I think they will be at high risk. Thank you. It's the same with netosis, uh, really. Silvio, did you want to unmute and ask your question, or do you just want me to read it? Okay, I'll read it. It says, um, he asks, um, are some of the ART drugs less likely to increase the cardiovascular risk than others? Well, there were big hopes for the new generation drugs like um, um, uh, dolutegravir and integrase inhibitors, but uh, more recently it was shown that they still have a metabolic impact. So I think this remains to be established. Yes, less than protease inhibitors, but still, still uh, there are more and more studies showing uh, an important metabolic uh, impact. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. That was very comprehensive. You covered a, a lot of interesting aspects of this and um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and again, um, hopefully we can have you here in person in the future so you can uh, interact with some more of the faculty, um, including those in our CIFAR. Um, but really appreciate you accepting our invitation and look forward to uh, continuing some of these discussions later. Yes, I would love to, to continue to discuss with you guys and, and start collaborations with your very strong group. Uh, uh, your university has a historically a very, very strong uh, HIV and SIV group, but uh, so uh, I, I would be very pleased. And of course, other areas of research, not only HIV and SIV, but maybe diets, maybe mm -hmm. metabolic diseases, maybe cardiovascular comorbidities, liver disease. I'm, uh, I'm very open to, to all these kind of collaborations. And thank you very much for having me. Thanks so much, Ivana. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you.